Annapurna Blues, Chapter 2 Return, Eight Months Later, April 1978 The Pan Am Clipper landed in Tehran as night fell. The captain ordered window shades closed and no photos. The Shah's rule was at an end, and the air was laden with tension. The flight was far from full. A few passengers disembarked, and fewer yet boarded for the onward red-eye leg to New Delhi. Airborne again, Jerry pressed his face against the window. Nothing to see above, nothing below. He bounced his knees and rubbed his legs. It took all his patience to endure the long flight. He fidgeted and kicked. He was itchy and agitated and wanted to land. He went to the back of the plane and had a smoke near the aft laboratories. Two Pan Am flights circled the Earth daily. Flight 001 flew west from San Francisco, and Flight 002 flew east from New York. In the 1970s, the Clippers were synonymous with adventure to far-flung destinations. Jerry's ticket had an open return date, and he had no idea when he would return to the U.S., He'd accepted an offer from an outfitter in Kathmandu to work as a trekking guide. He was all ready for a break from his studies at Cal Berkeley. In fact, he'd already dropped out of his hydrology master's program even before he accepted the offer. Jerry's mind ran away with itself in the confines of the plane, exactly what he was afraid of. Frail dreams and lost friends filled his mind. Three had all died in separate climbing accidents in the past year. As part of a Yosemite rescue, Brett rappelled off the end of his rope. He fell 2,000 feet. Karen died from a 95-foot fall from Rickson's Pinnacle behind Camp 4 in Yosemite. Randy drowned in the raging Kings River during his approach to Tehippity Dome. The searchers found his body with his pack still on, two waterfalls below where he'd slipped. Lost friends, now memories, their careless cocoons were shed. Jerry hoped they had found the perfect mountain with the cleanest rock and sterling companions. He hoped that they were in the pure land and that they all had attained liberation from the cycle of rebirth. He hoped for them what he hoped for himself. Back in Berkeley, his ex-bride-to-be, with her new daughter and husband, Jerry's longtime friend, It was complicated, and he hoped to forget it. She was against Jerry going to Nepal while it was just a concept. She didn't want him to join the Peace Corps and be away. She was against it from the start and knew being apart for so long wouldn't work. She was right, but it didn't make it any easier. He drifted off to sleep, his head against the cool plastic window. He had no dreams. He was suspended at the edge of space, somewhere over the Silk Road. Mingma Sherpa stood next to a mountain of pots and pans, tents and tarps, rolls of toilet paper and assorted trekking gear. He studied his list of provisions while he sorted the jumble of canned foods, fresh vegetables, bags of rice and sugar. Today he was making the loads porters would carry. Each load would fill a doka, a cone-shaped large basket woven from split bamboo. To be fair, each doka needed to be nearly the same weight, about 64 pounds. He carefully hefted each one as they were packed. Tony, the boss, had assigned young Mingma to be the Sirdar for Jerry's Annapurna group. The ambitious 22-year-old spoke fluent English and bubbled over with enthusiasm. He was earnest and sensitive and had dreams far beyond the trails and campsites. At five foot three inches, he was not tall, but his infectious sense of humor and quick smile raised his profile. His overall presence was slight, but his big personality made him seem larger. He was part of the first generation of Sherpa graduates from the schools built by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first Everest summiteer. 
The title of Sirdar applies to the Nepalese leader of the trek, and the job was different from Jerry's. The Sirdar is the chief guide and top man in the trekking staff. The Sirdar is in charge of the budget and handles all the money. It's a serious job, and a good Sirdar can make or break any trek or expedition. Jerry was the group leader for the foreigners, the man the clients looked to as the responsible representative of the company they had paid their money to. They learned about Mingma's role along the trail. Mingma took his job to heart. He'd worked for Tony twice before in the Everest region, his home turf. The Annapurna area had just opened and few guides had been there. None of the staff had been on the route before. It would be an adventure for everybody. Mingma told Rinji, the second kitchen boy, what to load into each doka. Mingma hefted each one to make sure of the weight. No extra com compensation was paid for the odd-shaped items or those out of the ordinary. It was the luck of the draw for the porters. One of Mingma's duties was to try to economize whenever possible. As supplies were consumed and the loads got lighter, porters were dismissed. Only the strongest and most essential porters stayed with the group for the crossing of Thorong La Pass. These porters were with the group for the entire trek. Everyone learned about everyone else. Mingma's notes were on a piece of paper, neat with lines and rows, all written in pencil. This document served as the main inventory of goods and equipment for the trek. Written on the locally made, soft, and durable handmade paper, it lasted the entire trek. Mingma packed the 25 baskets of provisions and equipment. The whole party, including porters, was 50 people. Baskets weren't the only thing on Mingma's mind. He noted all the items needed and gave Renji 500 rupees with a list of things to buy in the bazaar. He knew Renji never missed a detail, and it was Renji's way. Mingma called and confirmed the bus and the Land Rover for the first day of the trek. Preparations were almost complete. This trek was important for Mingma. He was full of ambition, and this trek was a master test. He needed to show competency before his family would loan him enough money to take flying lessons abroad. His dream was to become a helicopter pilot in the Nepalese army, and he needed a pilot's license to start. Mingma studied his list and continued to sort doka loads late into the night. He only stopped working when he looked up and saw Renji had fallen asleep. Mingma cleared a place on his cluttered bed and stretched out. He fell asleep checking his list. <laughs>